It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. There was this man from the estate running late. He was running for the bus when he accidentally bumped into this boy and his mate. The boys got mad and what was sad was that one drew a life and took the man's life. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. Now there's a grieving mother who screams at the skies above her. And on her knees at the grave, she claws at the earth for the boy she gave her life to after his birth. She's heartbroken to the core and not sure if she can go on anymore. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. Now there's a grieving father who lays awake at night wishing he tried harder. His guilt is out of control and now he has no soul. He wants to take his son's place and be his saving grace. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. Now there's a grieving daughter who's supposed to be getting wed but can't even face getting out of bed. The best day of her life has gone from good to bad because walking her to the altar was supposed to be her dad. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. Now there's a grieving sibling, a brother, who thought he could protect his mother and his whole family, but now he's lost in the depths of insanity. He's constantly on the brink, reaching for that next drink. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. Now there's a grieving sister. It feels like she's caught up in a twister because now she is missing a big brother who would always pick up the phone and listen. She's struggling to see this is now her reality. It only takes one punch, one shot, one knife to take one life. But it's not just one life that's taken, it's a whole family trying to cope with their hearts breaking. So my brother turned to this geezer and said, oh, more than welcome to come back to mine. Two of them walked into my brother's home, one walked out. He went from, Michael fell over. He went from, he was trying to help him up. He strangled him with the strap of a bag picked up the phone, so my mum's screaming down the phone. Boo, the police are here, Mike's dead. <laughs> no, not Michael, no, mum, not Michael. No, not Michael. That's all I kept saying, that's all I kept saying. No, mum, not Michael. Don't went over and kissed him. And I can still feel how ice cold his skin was. Just give him a kiss on the forehead. I can still picture, I can still vision how he looked right now as we're sitting there. This, this ain't true. This ain't true. Today, everyone, we have Eugene. Thanks for so much for coming. It was really hard to put down what Eugene is about. I mean, we're here for the obvious message. He's um, he's a victim like myself. We both lost our brother um, to to uh, murder and manslaughter. Um, and Eugene's got his fingers in a lot of pies when it comes to helping a lot of people. Um, I first come across you um, not long after I lost my brother. Um, you actually had a knife crime poem That's right, yeah. and uh, sent it to me. And uh, I, hopefully I could be able to put it up in, in this in this uh, podcast as well, maybe at the end or anything, so people can hear that as well. Absolutely amazing. Tell us about you and your journey, man, where it all... So my brother Michael was murdered in May 2015. Um, in the, you know, the, the immediate aftermath of Michael's murder, I hit the, the drink real bad. Um, I'm talking to the point where at one point I was drinking eight litres of rum a week. Wow. Um, yeah. Was you a big drinker before all of this happened? <sighs> not not on Monday to Friday, no. I liked a bit of a binge drink at the weekend. If I didn't have the kids, do you know what I mean? I've got kids now, so in my younger days, obviously go to the pub, watch the football, have a like, few all-day sessions with the lads um, in that sense. But I never drunk during the week, really. Did you find that you started drinking to help block out what you was truly thinking or did you use it 
as an excuse. And the only reason why I say this, and it's not a negative towards you and, and, and you know, this, this recent addiction, because you said you didn't drink before. My sister had a drink problem. And when my brother died, she then used that as an excuse to drink more. Um, was this something that, like, you figured out that that was a way to just drink, get off your nuts, so you didn't have to face, the like, what was happening to you at the time? So you think I didn't even really feel it. I think I was in that much of a shock. So obviously we found out, and I'm not going to lie, my immediate thought was, fuck me, I need a drink. But I'll drink, and it just didn't take no effect at all. So we didn't actually feel like I was drinking. Yeah. Obviously, when you look back, you know, obviously the dangers I was causing myself. I was drinking till like, sometimes two in the morning, sat up watching serial murder documentaries, trying to find answers in my head as to why my brother was murdered, still get up and still getting up at like half five, six o'clock in the morning, going to work. And I think of what like one day I remember like this digger driver I've walked in front of a digger driver three times on site. And this digger driver eventually turned around and went, mate, if you're not careful, I'm gonna fucking eat you with this And it was like a thirty ton digger. Yeah. So looking back on it, clearly it was affecting me. But at that time, it didn't feel like it was having any effect. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And I was, I was driving sometimes three hours to get to work. Really? On two hours sleep. Wow. The clarity of that is just insane, isn't it? Mm. Because I, I think in scenarios like this, we do depend on, like, I want to say the obvious, um, deterrence to try and stop you from feeling like you're in pain uh, to numb you of this um this deep depression that you're falling in at such a fast rate that it doesn't allow you to think capably mm. is that even a word like that capable thought so you just carry on and you mask it drink Mine was, um, I, d I didn't have, I didn't fall into the alcohol side of things. I fell into, um, my addiction was, um, I needed to cause destruction. I needed to kill. I needed to kill. I needed to kill. Mm -hmm. Um, in now I realized that luckily I didn't manage to, and, um, that I realized that I would have been just the same, you know, I would have been just like them. And, you know, putting yourself in the danger of alcohol, driving three hours, um, walking in front of diggers, you know, just the impact that goes on from there of, you know, if that guy ran you over and killed you, he's got to live with that. Or if you ran somebody into somebody and you killed them, you've got to live with that. Then their families have to live with it. We become no better than the people that took our brother's lives. No, exactly. My, my life kind of took a bit of a reversal. Whereas I'd work a week, and if I didn't have the kids... I would drink at the weekend, whereas I went to drinking all week, I would stop on a Friday, have my kids the weekend, the second the kids went home to their mum, I was back drinking again. Yeah. So I wouldn't drink when I had the kids, but I was in, I was dangering everybody else's life, like you say, when I was drinking. Mm. And that was, it got to the point where, I'm not even sure what happened, but I had a bit of a penny drop in moment when I thought, hang on a minute, I need to think about my kids. I need to think about my mum. She's just buried one of her children. She doesn't deserve to be burying another child. My brother's kids ain't going to see their dad again. I can't put that on my children. Mm. So I kind of had that, and I, I can't point a finger on it. I know, obviously, I got, you know, I got uh, a lot of support from a charity called Sam National, support after murder and manslaughter. And I can't thank them enough for all they did for their support. And they're, you know, seven years down the line, they still support me now. But I can't put a finger on that precise moment where I thought, hang on a minute, you need to take yourself in the corner and have a bit of a word with yourself here. Your kids deserve better. Your mum deserves better. Your siblings deserve better. Your family deserves better. Yeah. Yeah. And do you know what it is? It's quite amazing how, like, you can go from a cloud to pure clarity of direction of travel mm. in it, it, and it, it you don't like like you said i don't know what made it happen but when it happens you just know that that you have to sink yourself into into that clarity mm. fast before you end up 
you know, causing more pain, i.e., to your mum and stuff. So, the, so you lost your brother to um, to to murder. Tell us a little bit about your brother. Give us a little bit of a build up of of what your brother was like. And was he your older? Was he your yeah, younger? Yeah, much three years older than me. Um, we're very, but in some respects we're chalk and cheese. In some respects we're. <laughs> I know that. I know pod. that feeling. You know, we we've both got the same heart. We've both got the same care and nature. I was a typical, for the sake of the words, boys boy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Go out, play football, get dirty. Mike was quite shy, quite withdrawn. I remember one family member giving us like 15 remote control cars. I can't remember why. Mike went, you can have one. I'm keeping 14. Yeah. Because I'm going to dismantle the whole lot and try and put them back together. Oh, yeah. That was, Mike liked that sort of, that's the kind of challenge Mike liked. He liked to sort of dismantle things and see, see you know, how to put them back together. Um but Mike generally, he had an absolute heart of gold. Absolute heart of gold. If, and I've said it so many times, if you was hungry and you turned up on Mike's doorstep and he had one tin of beans, he's getting out two spoons. He would never, ever turn anyone away. Um, Mike only saw people. And what I mean by that, he didn't see gender, he didn't see race, he didn't see social status. He's, all he saw was, you're, you're a person. Sounds like my kind of guy. Yeah. And that's, that, that was Mike. You need an ear to chew, come and chew my ear. You, you want a shoulder to cry on, come and cry on my shoulder. That was him. You know what I mean? And Yeah, it was just one in a million, really. Well, not even one in a million, probably more Did than that. Did he know you looked up to him like that? That's one of my guilts. But probably not. I think I share that with you. Mm. I share that with you deeply. Yeah. And that is something I've got to live with. You know? We have, with all the emotions and everything we go through, all the thoughts, feelings, the erratic grieving process, guilt's always you know, way up here. Yeah, I had a love hate relationship with my brother. I'd never let him I'd never let him down if he ever needed me, but at the same time, jealousy was a massive form there and it wasn't from me, it was from my brother towards me. And um he like I said in podcasts before, he always used to tell me and I say to us, It should be me where you are and you looking up to me the way that I look up to you. But I don't think he realised just how much of a big factor he was to me mm. that whilst he was alive, everything I did was to try and get him back on the path he once was when I did look up to him in the way that he wanted me to. I already viewed him that way. Mm. But because I was like the blue eyed boy and, and he was like a little bit of the outcast. So he, he called himself a misfit, you know, um, it was hard for him to actually see the relationship for what it was. And that was love. Mm. And again, for me also to be able to show him love because we were geezers, we were boys. Boys don't show love. We show strength, you know, and that's really sad because now I understand that you can show your sibling love, whether it be a boy or a girl. Mm. I only know now that it was acceptable after I can't do it. Yeah. Exactly. But one of the ways one of the ways I see it is I was a sheep. I was trying to follow everyone to try and get acceptance from everyone. Mike was the sheep dog. He just overlooked. And he took it in and he's like, I am what I am. You know, he he didn't care about fashion. He would wear what he wanted. He would mingle who with who he wanted. You know, one day he might talk to a guy who's got 10 grand's worth of clothing. Next day, he's talking to someone that's got five quid clothing from Primark. Yeah. You know, he just, that was Mike. He didn't, didn't care about that sort of stuff. Whereas me, I was just like, <laughs> fucking deer in the headlights. I want to be accepted. I want to be accepted. Yeah. And I just think, that's, look back, it's like pathetic. Yeah. Absolutely pathetic. Why do you think that is as men that we fail to see like any of this for what it really is until we get traumatized with such a horrific, like life changing experience before we wake up and be like, fucking hell, I was a dickhead. Uh, you know, yes. I should have grabbed you. I should have pulled you in. 
Mm. And I should have just said what I needed to say. I mean, me and Mike didn't necessarily have a bad relationship. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, when you're kids, teenagers, you know, all, all bloody siblings' ages argue when they're teenagers, don't they? But as we grew up, we had a bond. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm a football fan. He's not. But he would take the time. If I say, right, I'm going down the pub to watch football, he'll come with me. I wasn't necessarily into it, but he just wanted to spend time with me. Yeah. So we didn't have, there was no jealousy there. There was no sort of bad blood. But at the same time, like you say, the keys are, I'm not going to tell him what I feel. Sibling, sibling wars. Yeah, I'm not going to tell him I love him or. He already knows. He knew. Yeah, but like, it's like, ah, well, I don't need to tell you, you know, right? Yeah. Nice to hear it though, right? Yeah. Just that one last time. Yeah. And it was, and it, it wasn't just, it was showing him that respect that I'm talking about, the way I looked up to him, the way I did. I was, in a sense, do you know what? Take back what I said just a minute ago about no jealousy. I was probably jealous of his freedom. Not him, but his freedom of choice. His freedom to behave, to be able to be himself with no inhibitions. He was mine. That's the way he was. The gentle giant. The amount of stories I've heard about my brother from people I never even knew existed since he was murdered has been mind blowing. And again, that's a credit to Michael because he never bragged about anything. If that's the footprint that he's left on life, he lived a good life, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I had women say, do you know what, if I was in the pub drinking and, I wanted, and I'm saying I'm going, your brother was telling me he's walking me home. And he didn't want to kiss. He didn't want to fumble on the doorstep. He'd walk her to the door, have a good night, and he's away. Gentleman. Absolute gentleman. You know? So, so what? Uh, this this gentleman, uh, this this man, that I feel like I would have really liked. You know what I mean? What what led led this this night to happen f for for your brother and your family? Like, tell me about like why would someone want to do this? Exactly, exactly, Paul. Why would anybody want to do that to my? And this is the question that has gone over and over and over in my head. Why? Why, Michael, why would you do, why would anybody want to hurt my brother? And we don't know. All we know is that good heart of his probably opened the door to this person. He was round a friend's house. There's a few people there having a conversation, whatever, you know, just general meet up with some mates around someone's house. The owner of the house went, so I'm going to have to kick everyone out, go and shopping. So my brother turned to this geezer and said, oh, more than welcome to come back to mine. I think Michael probably knew he was a bit troublesome. And that's probably why he invited him back. But do you know what? I could have a little chat with this bloke. Might be able to, you know, have a little chat with him, see if we can sort of see what his uh, bother is, see if I can help him in any way, see if he wants to talk about anything. Two of them walked into my brother's home, one walked out. That's just pretty much as all we know. Wow. Obviously, you hear from the coroner and the evidence of how Michael's life was taken. But as to the why, Michael had no defensive wounds, which I wouldn't expect him to. All we've got is five lies five different accounts of what happened by the perpetrator. Um, um, and are you okay to divulge that? Are you, are you okay to go into well, the five he, different... He went from Michael fell over. He went from he was trying to help him up. He strangled him with the strap of a bag. A rack sack? Uh, no, no, Adidas man bags. Man bags. That you get. Yeah, he strangled him with one of them. So he's, at one point he said he tried to pick him up with it. You don't pick somebody up with the strap of a bag around someone's neck. And the coroner said it was between 20 and 30 seconds it would have taken. You don't try and pick somebody up for 20 to 30 seconds. 
So yeah, asphyxiation is is quite a long a long thing to do, um, especially with a, a man bag. Of course, struggle too. You know, that it, it seems like there is just some cruel people in this world, and sometimes you try your hardest to be able to to help everybody. Unfortunately for your brother, that led to him being taken from you, being taken from all of us. You know what I mean? He, he, uh, uh, and for what? With no no understanding as to why this would have happened, because you know that your brother's not a violent person. Mm. You know he's kind, caring. How you've stated he has been in this, I believe. You know, and and the fact that. Was this guy just purposely going out that night? Could it have been anybody? It, it probably could have been anybody. From from all the stories I've heard about this guy, I don't think it could have been anyone. Oh, really? So you think I'm not that saying he, picked, he, he, he set him. out to murder my brother, but I think because my brother isn't confrontational, my brother was never going to fight back. Easy target, you mean? Yeah. As much as I hate to say it. That's sad. That is a sad. If there was a fight in a pub that was across the room and my brother had nothing to do with it, chances are he'd probably walk out. He didn't like it. He didn't like violence. You know? I, I, I think from what I'm getting from you with your brother, he was very pure. And, you know, taking his way from himself being in a negative environment is always a positive for him because he could always carry on with positivity. Because once you start absorbing the negativity, you, you then express it too. And for your brother, I think by the sounds of it, he would have established that from the very beginning. Stay away from the negative, create the positive, and hopefully he can help people along the way. And even if people were negative towards him, he would try and turn it into a positive. You know, come out with things like, no, oh, don't worry, it's just the way they are. And they wouldn't start an argument, don't worry about it, it's just the way they are. And that's just the way he was. So when, when this happened, um, what, what happened? Did the guy call the police? Did he just up and leave and just hope that it would go away? Like No, you get like the two houses where there's a flat at the bottom and flat at the top. Yeah. There was, Mike was in the top one, this lady was in the bottom one. And before even Mike moved in there, she had CCTV put round. Um, so you, obviously you see this guy and my brother walk in, however long, I can't remember. What was the, the body language like as they went in? Did you, have you seen this video? Yeah, I saw it in court. But did it seem like they were just two guys having a chat yeah. going into the house? Yeah, you wouldn't think nothing of it. It just seemed like there's two mates walking into a, to a property. And I can't remember the exact amount of time, but... Then he walks out, closes Michael's door, like nothing had happened. Walked out the path. I think there was a bit of a stumble from what I remember, because I think they'd had a couple of drinks. Nothing too excessive. And then he closes the gate and walks off. And he goes and tells, I think it was six different people, I think I've just killed Michael. Wow. I strangled him until his legs stopped kicking. Do, do you know the persona that he said this? No. Obviously, it, we can only go by it's witness. It's so paper. hard. It's so hard to to capture the like the the emotion, the feelings, the persona that the person has just gone in and told people six people, and it wasn't six people together. It was he told a couple of people, told a couple of people, told a couple of people. Did they just air it off and be like, "Oh, go away, you're drunk"? Or I think did one they... of them turned around. I think one of them was kind of like, nah, fuck it. He ain't. But the other one was like, well, I think we should really go and check. And I think they went and they were knocking on Michael's door and he wasn't answering. And this, at this point, the lady downstairs, Chris, I think she had banging and the police turned up and they're trying to like, at this point, they're trying to really fuck it. They're worrying now. They're banging on the door. Um, so I think there was a bit of confrontation with the police and they're trying to get their point of story across. We've been told... Um, that he's been murdered and obviously then the police go in and find him. 
What was the? Do you know the time scale from from when he'd of when your brother um, would have been pronounced dead um, from the asphyxiation at the beginning? Not the length of time on how when it was from when the person did it to when he left to be able to tell anyone so they could possibly come back and help him. Because you find with with a lot of people that I've podcasted in my time, like when it comes to things like this, um, the person stays in the house for quite a while afterwards. I don't think, well, he was arrested within 24 hours. I mean, I think the, the very last person he told, he tried to hide in the house. And I think he, I can't remember exactly, so don't quote me. I think he got a message from someone else or a phone call from someone else and he's done it. So he got him out of the house and by this point the police were looking for him. And I think he basically got him to the police. Wow. Or where the police were looking for him. So once once he'd been arrested, once the police have been there, because the people that would have been knocking on the door, the police would have automatically thought that they would have had something to do with it. You know, straight away, there would have been that massive commotion of being like, what are you doing here? What is he to you? Like, how do you find out about this? Yeah. They would have said, this guy in the pub, um, the investigation would have been started straight away. The manhunt for this guy would have been out there. Um, did the six people come in and give full information on what this person said? As far as I'm aware, they all, they all give their statements. statements. I think there was three or four that stood up in court. I think it was. And I think one of them was the perpetrator's girlfriend. Oh, really? Yeah. And I f- She'd either just had a baby with him or she was pregnant. It's crazy, isn't it? Whilst, whilst you're in the ma- middle of making a life, you know, you're, you're taking one. Right, and in that, while you say that, Michael turned 40 on the 17th of April. He just found out he was going to be a dad again. Shortly after, he was murdered on the 30th of April. Uh, 30th of May, sorry. Wow. The day after my mum's birthday. So he, he, he found out that he was going to be a dad the day after your mum's birthday. No, he was murdered in the day between after. April and the May, obviously that's a month. Yeah. He found out he was going to be a dad again. Wow. Couldn't tell you the exact day, but in that, in that month period. It's it's just, you know, I, I, another like I find like even with my brother, my brother just found out his daughter was having his grandchild, as well. You know, like literally, like a week before. I'm pretty sure it was a week before. It's just crazy. Like this new life is being brought in, while somebody takes away the old life. Like it's just the thing to do, and this new generation that, that's coming from our family members are not even going to be there to watch and they're never going to know who they are other than a photograph. No, exactly. Mo- a podcast. Yeah. Michael Jr. was born, obviously, after Michael was murdered. Michael Jr., yeah? yeah. Like that. Mm. I named my son um, St. Dino after my brother. Mm. It was... Well, obviously, Mike, Mike's three years older than me. So when I turned... Mike's birthday's the 17th of April. Mine's the 10th of April. I turned 40 on the 10th of April. And not long after that, I found out I was going to be a dad again. Wow. So I went through this period of time where I generally thought history was going to repeat itself. I was training to do the Three Peaks Challenge in 24 hours. And I was having nightmares of being stabbed on the top of Ben Nevis in the snow. Really? Yeah. And I still did it, even though I had all these nightmares. And then when it comes to the February, when my boy was born, who I called Jai Michael... Not only did I make it to um, Joy's birth of all this fear, I then had to live with the guilt of being there at my son's birth when my brother couldn't be there at his son's birth. It's crazy how that knock-on effect really can... The ripple effect is yeah. devastating. It's unreal. Mm. It's unreal. So this guy, he's been arrested 24 hours after, after he'd found out. Yeah. Um, how did you get the news? We live just outside of Portsmouth, a place called Hayland Island. Mike was actually living in Stafford, Stoke. Um, 
obviously the the message has been re relayed from Stafford to Hampshire's or our local police station. They've poor, picked on some poor young naive newbie police officer and pinged him off to my mum's address on his own to give my mum the news that her son's been murdered. So he turns up on my mum's doorstep. My mum's not there, but Michael's eldest daughter is. Ah. Oh. So she's phoned my mum, who's at my sister's. Grandma, there's police here. Mum's come home. There's this young, I say, new police lad. And no disrespect to him, but he stood there shaking like a shitting dog, not knowing what to say to me mum. Hang on, where's your senior? Why aren't there two people delivering this news? Yeah, we had two turn up for my, for my mum. This yeah. is the way it should be. Yeah. And at, in the end, my mum's asking him if he wants a seat. Do you want a seat? Are you all right? <laughs> Shock, mate. Shock get you twisted in so many different ways. It's like, it's like... It's not just the shock of it, though, Paul. It was the fact that he was so petrified of delivering this news because he's new to the job. My mum's trying to take care of him. Yeah. And he's going, is there anything I can do for you? Well, I was at my daughter's when my my uh, granddaughter called me. Can you go and get her? Oh, can you tell me where that is? I don't know Hayden very well. What? Yeah. Surely everyone's got Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever on their phone. Well, the but, car would have been fitted with it as well. Well, you'd think so, wouldn't you? So my mum's having to try direct him to my sister's, having to try to process the news that her son's been murdered. That's absolutely insane. Hmm. I, I I remember when my mum got the news, she smashed the whole house up. She literally smashed the house up. There was two people. They still didn't know what to do with her. I don't think, for me, when I heard the news, I believed it. Because not my brother. No, same as me. Didn't instant denial. Yeah, not my brother. Couldn't have happened. I sat there more like, looked at a copper, I was like, are you, are you sure you got the right person? They went, Paul, we know you guys. You know, we know, we've known Dane for years. We, we definitely, and I even though they said that, I'm still like, yeah, but are you sure? They can't take him, not him. That's pretty much the words that come out of my mouth. My, my cousin died when she was six, of cystic fibrosis. Her birthday's the 30th of May. That's the day Mike was murdered. I had my kids that day. Normally I'll go down to the cemetery on Tasha's birthday and I'll take flowers down to the cemetery. I had the kids. So after I took the kids home, I was going down the next day on the, 30, the 31st. And the phone rang. For whatever reason, it come up, no caller ID. Which I found quite odd. And it wasn't linked to the, the stereo in the car, so I pulled over, picked up the phone. So my mum's screaming down the phone. Boo, the police are here. Mike's dead. <laughs> no, not Michael. No, mum. Not Michael. No. Not Michael. That's all I kept saying. That's all I kept saying. No, mum. Not Michael. But it was. <clears throat> and at that point, didn't even know he'd been murdered. Just that he was dead. So it could have been an accident. It could have been anything, you know what I mean? And, but even in that moment, obviously knowing my brother the way I do, no. No way. <clears throat> and even, like, obviously, not say it was in Portsmouth, Mike, obviously we had to travel up to Stafford to go and see Michael in the mortuary. Even when I'm stood there, this close from his body, I'm still looking for makeup. I'm looking for it to be a dummy. I'm looking for some sick, twisted bastard to come out from a curtain and go, eh, it's all a joke. It's, uh, listen, I fully, fully 
relate to that because I was waiting for him to go, gotcha. Yeah. And I, you know, my my sisters are giving him kisses on the forehead, and obviously they're crying. And <clears throat> but I, it it probably took me, I, I couldn't hit a while. I don't know. It seemed like hours. I was just stood there, look at like staring, waiting, begging, wishing for it not to be true. And it was only when I think my mum said we need to think about leaving. I went over and kissed him and I can still feel how ice cold his skin was just give him a kiss on the forehead I can still picture I can still vision how he looked right now as we're sitting there this, this ain't true this ain't true I'll kiss my brother on the forehead I thought he was going to be rock hard. Mm -hmm. I didn't prepare for the cold. I didn't prepare for that at all. No, I didn't. I didn't know what to think, to be honest with you. It was only then that I realised that he was actually dead. It was how cold he was. Mm -hmm. And then to try and stay focused, to try and help out mum sisters that were also doing the same things as what you was doing your sisters were doing it's really hard mm. so hard in fact it still plays with you today right mm. it's really strange because i spoke to mums i've spoke to so many people but this is the first time i've spoke to um, a brother on camera who's lost a brother It's hard. Really hard. Because I feel like you went through the same feelings as I did. And I thought I was alone. That's one of the hardest feelings, is feeling that alone. Yeah. So, from this, was your brother buried or cremated? He was cremated, then buried. Yeah. He was cremated, and then his ashes were interred into my nan and granddad's grave. <clears throat> my mum's nice. my dad. Because nan's was Michael's happiest place when he was like a little boy. That was always happy, you know, that was always his happy place. And that's what mum wanted, and obviously respect that. It's really hard when you lose a brother to murder or you lose a child to to being to, to a crime because they don't give you them back like you would do if you was dying from natural causes. You know, you, it, they show you, then they take them away again and do the criminal side of things. Then they show you again, then they take them away and do a second one because it's going to the superior courts or the high courts. And you just think to yourself... Just fucking give me him back so I can lay him to rest. You can't do this to him no more. Mm. You know? Last last place that I know my brother wanted to be after he died is in a police station for three, four months still, do you know, like in in a criminal in a criminal uh mm. the, the police morgue. I know that he would not have wanted to have been there. So that would have been I know if he was looking down that would have been a real slap in the face for him. Like, I'm done now, you still put me in prison, you know, I'm still I'm still getting sentenced, you know. But that that whole, I don't know whether it was the same for you, but being able to go back and see, then put him back in the fridge, then come back and you can go and see him again and then you put him back in the But each time he just looks so different, so different every single time. Looks like because of the distance. Obviously, we spent that time in Stafford. We went to see Michael in the mortuary. We went to his home and laid flowers and had a drink. and But there had to be a point where we had to come back. So it wasn't to and fro, but he was transported from Stafford to a funeral director's in Portsmouth. And mum being the mum she is, she done everything in her power to protect us, as, even though at the age we are, protect us as much as she could to 
try and relieve. She took so much on board herself and kept it to herself because she didn't want to add any additional sort of heartbreak and pain to us kids. So mum kind of dealt a lot of it on her own, you know, a lot of it on her own. Um, some of the stuff she's opened up and told us since, and you, I can sit here and go, oh, I wish you'd told me. Yeah. But I get why she did it, you know? Yeah. I get why there's certain elements she kept to herself, and not just to protect us, but because simply it was, that's my boy. That was my firstborn, you know? Mm-hmm. So... Mike, uh, mum brought Michael into the world. Mum was going to see Michael out of it, to the best of her, you know, to the best of her mother's ability. So, yeah, we can sit here and go, oh, I wish you'd told me. I could have done this, I could have done that. But the truth is, could I, at that time, could I have done it? Could I have intruded on what mum wanted? So I get what she did. So, yeah, Michael was up in Stafford, then he come. Uh, Mum sorted all the arrangements out for uh, Michael to come to the uh, the funeral, obviously uh, funeral directors. But we could go and see him there once he was there. And the funeral director, bless him, was amazing. Never de- dealt with a murder in his life, ever. So he put Michael in a separate room. Obviously, the top half of the coffin was open, and it was like, "You want to come in? You want to spend time with Michael?" But, you know, all the time we're open, just give us a bit of notice. And he let us spend any time we wanted with him. So I'd go in there, take a little speaker with me, put on some of Michael's music and just sit there and talk to him. So that, in the whole process, for the better choice of words, was nice. I could have that time Yeah. with Michael's music, just gentle in the background and just sit there and talk to him. But again, it's, you know, it's what... Mum sorted all that out. When when you are in the room and your brother is there, especially your big brother, and he's laying there, can't do nothing, helpless, you've got all the why, the what ifs. There is that moment of closeness that you have with, with, with him that you never had before. The silence. The silence of... No words, no arguments, just that silence of you both know how much you meant to each other. And that's exactly it. That's exactly right. Because there was times I would sat there, 20 minutes, not a word. But there was times I would sat there for five minutes instead of 100 words. And you did, you're did exactly right what you say. It's just that closeness, just next to each other, no words needed, no arguments, no disagreements. But there's that, you feel that closeness. Yeah. There's two times that I felt closer to Michael than ever. Once was in that room, and once was on top of Ben Nevis. And I still cannot quite put into words when I was at the top of Ben Nevis, I told you about all the nightmares. <clears throat> That's probably the closest I've ever felt to Michael since he was murdered. We done Ben Nevis for my brother as well. Mm. It's just so surreal, like how much your story links to my story. Mm-hmm. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's really hard to 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 put in there because for me, I felt like I felt that on my own. Like, no one could feel like this. No one could feel the way that I feel. It's one of the reasons I wanted this podcast so much. Not because I knew we was going to necessarily have those links, but from one brother to another, who's pretty much gone through the same. What happened with the guy? Did you have a trial with him? Yeah, four days. Four days, yeah? Four days. And Inclusive. Took, um, 65 minutes to come back with a unanimous decision. Yeah. It was that quick we actually thought he got away with it. 
because the time we've left the courtroom and we got taken down into this private room we was in and it was like I think mum or me or one of us was laying on the sofa I can't even remember if it was me or my mum actually someone said oh somebody want a cup of tea and the kettle was put on and the next minute the flow's come in you need to get back up in the courtroom now so didn't even feel like 60 minutes. Yeah. Didn't even feel like half an hour. Did, what evidence did they have to make sure that it was pinned to him, that it was him? Because um, he obviously didn't want to admit, oh, no, he did admit that something had happened, mm. but not murder. Yeah. Obviously, like I said, there was only two of them went in and one come out. DNA evidence, his, obviously, his account of what happened. So it was pretty, you know, there, was, there wasn't really... But even his defence barrister didn't even really deny he did it, but he was trying to talk about his state of mind when he did it. So they were trying to take that angle, even though there was, I think it was something like a three-month full of psych evaluation on him to see if there was anything wrong with him. And it was like, no, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just a horrible bastard, basically. So his defence didn't have any defence. Was did this person have family that attended? Yep. Mum, nan and auntie and a brother. What were they like towards you as a didn't family? Even look in our direction. And his brother didn't even sit next to his own family. It was kinda like he was ashamed. He sat away from them. Did they say anything to you? No. Not sorry or nothing? No. Nothing. Wow. How, how long did he get? 18 years minimum. And the judge said he won't even be accountable for, uh, accepted for parole in 18 years if he doesn't give an accurate account of what happened. You got a good sentence there for a manslaughter charge. No, Mur it's murder, not manslaughter. Oh, you got murder, did you? Yeah. Oh, wow. So I was going to say that years, was... 15 year tariff plus an additional three years. That's... Yeah, the, the, when they done my brothers, they done um, straight eighteen uh, before you can apply for parole. Mm -hmm. um, um, and they, I wish they would have said that you wouldn't be allowed unless you gave the answer. I wish they would have said that because I don't fully know why. Just like you don't fully know why, and that is fucking emptiness. Mm -hmm. Reason why. For what reason? Like, there is no reason that you could possibly justify murder. But surely you had a reason for why you did it. Surely you own the responsibility to be able to tell me, us as a family, why you chose that was your option. I've got a 16-year-old son that wants to go and see him in prison. He, he wants that answer. He was 10. When I had to give him that news, I had to sit him down and know him full well what I was about to tell him was going to destroy his life. He went from being academically able, uh, fantastic footballer, to completely going off the rails. Didn't want to know at school, didn't want to play football anymore. Got all these questions, why dad, why dad, why dad, why dad? Why Michael Dad? So that is just fueling my fire. Don't get me wrong, he's doing well now. He's got back into football, he's doing well at school, he's he's getting there, do you know what I mean? But he's still up until a, probably a year ago, I want to see him in prison. I want to go and see him, I want to ask him, I want to know why he did what he did, Dad. And I'll tell you what, Dad, if he even smirks at me, I'm going to launch him across that fucking table. They have all that closed because I thought to myself that that would be a way of me being able to get them, uh, seeing them face to face. Mm. But they stick you behind a, they, they still protect them, don't they? Mm. Stick them behind a glass screen so you can't get to them. You can't, you can't physically touch them. I'm trying to explain that to a broken hearted 14 year old. I'm trying to explain that to, to anyone of any age mm. that they want to, f the, the reason. But for for him to be able to go through that at such a young age and then at 16 
be affecting him the, the way it has. You can only imagine without support what he'd end up going through or doing um, to himself or others out of anger and not realising, you know, getting yeah. lost in that moment is, it, you get lost. Mm. I'm glad he's got you there to help him because you have a wider understanding of how to think more so in a way where you're helping rather than than creating the negative. Mm. And for your son, that is a massive, massive plus to have you in his life to be able to do that, even though you want the same answers he wants. Mm. For you to be able to be there to guide him will stop your son from turning into the person who he's trying to get answers from. Because it's so sort of gone. Well, he's, he's recently passed trials to go and play football in America. That's brilliant. So he's, you know, it's not perfect. His life isn't a fairy tale now. He's still got his questions. He still wants answers. But he's got back to the point where he can channel his emotions in the right way, and that's through football. And that's what helps him. So Yeah. And obviously me and his mother support him the best way we can, or well, the rest of my family do. Yeah, that's good. Right. That's really, who's supporting you? Uh, charity called Sam National. Yeah, you said that. Yeah, support after murder and manslaughter. I get a lot of support from them. Um, obviously, I get support from my mum as well and my partner. Um, oh, my partner, bless her. <laughs> they go through it, don't they? <laughs> that they do, mate. That they do, because I just, I don't, my, my head never stops. I always have to be on the go. I'm, um, I'm always coming up with something that I want to do to raise money for, and it's not always like I say, I've, I've raised money for Sam National, but I've raised money for a lot of other charities as well. Yeah, you do a lot. That's why it was hard on how, how to introduce you into, <laughs> yeah. into the, into the podcast because, um, I, I stumbled across you for a knife crime poem, um, you know, and you do things for so many different people, don't you? Well, I've done the, like the, the first charity, but when I, like I said, I got that, that moment where it was like, right, I need to do better by my mum. I need to do better by my kids. Um, I got in, engaged with Sam National a lot, lot more and I was, like, got phone support from them. So it was like, right, oh, two things. I want to give back to this charity. But first and foremost, I want to keep my brother's memory alive. What can I do? My brother's name's Michael. The only thing I could think of that rhymed with Michael was cycle. So it was like, right. Okay, cycle for Michael. What am I going to do? Well, this charity run a retreat three times a year. All expense paid retreat for their members. That's how well they look after you. Do you know what I mean? It's fantastic. It's very therapeutic what they do. Well, I live in Portsmouth. The retreat's in Crewe. It's just 200 miles. So I thought, right, I'm going to do it. Cycle for Michael. I'm going to cycle. Never cycled before. You got on a push bike and cycled 200 miles? I trained. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I just went to the shop and bought one. And so, I, so I looked at the dates of the retreat and I went for the last one. I thought, right, it gives me longer to train, but also it gives me longer to raise awareness, longer to raise money. So that's what I did. Trained for 11 months, 226 miles in two days, 135 miles the first day, 91 miles the second day. And it was good. Do you know what I mean? It kept... I was getting Michael's name out there. I was getting the charity's name out there. I think I raised like seven grand, I think, for the charity on that one. But once it was over, I was back to the thoughts of what happened. I was back to that again. I was back to going back that, that down path and I was back to drinking again. I started drinking again. So it was be, well, I need to do something else. <sighs> mountains for Michael. What mountains can I climb? Like there's a free peaks challenge. I'm not to do that. So I did that, trained for that, raised some more money. But again, once that was after, I was back to the thoughts and back to the drinking. So now it's it's got to the point now, like I did, say for example, I did um, Snowden by Night last year for the British Lung Foundation. Before I'd even got to the bottom of Snowden, I'm thinking, right, what can I do next? So most people will do a challenge and they're like, have two months break or whatever they do and, you know, rest the body. I've not even got to the bottom of the mountain and I'm thinking, right, what can I do? What can I do next? Who can I raise for next? 
because what I said to you earlier, whereas Michael only saw people, that's how I want to view charity. People say that you only tend to like raise awareness and money for a charity that's affected you. Well, I want to have Michael's outlook. I want to help all the charities. Yeah. Like he wanted to help everyone. I want to help all the charities. So I'll raise, I'll do like a, a variety of events, events for, you know, a variety of charities. Keeps me busy, keeps me off the drink. But for the missus, it's a nightmare. It's like, yo, what are you doing next? And do you know, she's at home, she's looking after the kids, she's grafting. You know, being a good mum, a good partner and all that. So it's not easy for her either. I can vouch for it. Yeah. Not your missus, my missus, you know, like um, I'm, I'm out, I'm raising awareness everywhere and I'm just leaving it to her to hold down hold down the pad, you know, hold down the family yeah. and yeah. make sure everything's good. I, I still put my part in, but um, I, I should I should be at home more, but I'm out trying to help spread the message, um, which I find is just as important, you know. Um, it is. It is important, isn't it? And it's, 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 if it wasn't important, we wouldn't be doing it, would we? It's just a shame that, like, and I, I, I say this a lot, and it's, it's a shame that we have to get to a point where we have to feel a loss to be able to make a difference, mm. you know, nationally. Mm. You know, uh, a lot of the people that I talk to now, a lot of the people that I'm associated with now, a lot of the people that I podcast or I do lives with, I involve with charities, I'm surrounded by victims. People that was left over, that's been left over to deal with the pain, that have been forgotten by, by the law, by the government, by society we've been put into this cauldron of mess and we're left to try and figure out how the hell we're going to get out of it yeah. and i found more unity in the weakness that has been stowed upon me for me to fail for me to break for me to just curl up and die i found more strength in unity with people that are broken than I did with people that are not, that people who I thought were my friends, that people who I thought had the same outlook, the same clarity, the same same movement to be able to push for a positive were actually just bringing me down. Mm. And it's such a shame that I can admit guilt to myself that I was guilty of being that same person that didn't think that I would ever be a victim to anything in my life. But your brother already knew that without losing anybody. Mm. He already felt that without feeling the pain of loss. It sounds like he already had his head screwed on and was not driven in any way like how we was to be able to just put makeup on it and just fucking cover it up, do this and do that. He saw through all the bullshit. Yeah, he did. Mm. And it is a shame that you had to go through that loss for you to be able to see the same thing he already saw naturally. Mm. But now I, feel like I call everything Michael's legacy, Michael's journey. Everything I do, is, that, that is it. It's, it's for Michael. It's, it's, it's carrying on what, like you say, he, he already saw it. So now it's down to me to carry that on, to carry on his perspective, carry on his, his mentality. I know people would probably disagree with me. I don't, I'll never be half the person my brother was. That's how I feel. And nothing anybody can say will ever change that because that's the regard I hold him in, you know? I know exactly what you mean. But I will spend the rest of my life trying. I made a promise to all my family after Mike was taken. I made two promises. One to my family was that all the time I've got air in my lungs, I'll keep Michael's memory alive. Before Mike was murdered, I had a fallout with my mum and we didn't speak for about a year. The second promise I made was at Michael's grave that I would never, ever fall out with my mum again. And that's the two that, obviously my family and my kids and obviously they mean of course. everything to me, but those two promises keep me going. That's really nice that you say that because I, I, I had the fortune of meeting your mum today. You brought her along with you today. Mum, mm. 
mum comes with me on everything. Do you know what I mean? She drove me to Scotland <laughs> when yeah. I've done the three pigs. She was my support driver when I cycled to crew. Do you know, when I went and done my skydive, she was there. Do you know, she's, I went to Chelmsford to the Knife Angel to recite my poetry. She was with me. Went to the retreat at the weekend. She was with me. Do you know what I mean? It's, that's kind of, we have those times together. There are like, um, obviously when I'm at home and mum's at home, like she'll go and see my sisters and obviously I spend time with my sisters and my family and, you know, so it's all quite a mixed, sort of mixed bag. But then that's kind of like our time when I do these crazy things that I come up with. It's good. And, I, I, and I'm sure like, I, I believe that my brother looks down upon me and you probably believe that too and that he's there with you. Um, and, and you know, like, I think from the kind of person you've described to me, he is that um, he would look at it as a positive, what's happened to him, that to bring you and your mum closer together. Mm. Do you, do you yeah, feel yeah, that? Yeah, yeah definitely, yeah. And it's, it's really beautiful that a, 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 you can create a new friendship with a natural love. You know, um, that because you know, when, when your kids are born, whether you fall out or not, you love you can't not love your own child, you brought you into this world, you know. Um, but reciprocating that is massive because you're working on a friendship that's being built through pain, mm. and um, the fact that you both know what you're going through yeah, that's a connection right there, you know. Um, and then working on it, which is really great, you know, um, because you you might not know or you or you do know if she tells you but you're you're more of a strength to her than what you possibly realize of her being able to be your support worker doing the car runs at <laughs> 200 miles and 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 the peaks and driving to Scotland and and Chelmsford and you know you're actually helping her a lot mm. too I imagine uh, as, I hope so yeah as, as she if she ever told you yeah, I don't always necessarily listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's the other thing as well is is the, um, you know, is is the listening part. Mm. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's important. we're still men, we're still stubborn. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. So, so with Michael and his legacy, where is it taking you? Where's 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 the next steps? What's next for you to be able to? Because three peaks. Uh, I was up half of the mountain and I was like, what, there's another two of these. Like, <laughs> my groins were hurting. I'd done no training. I was there. I had a pair of shorts on, a hoodie, a rain mac, and a pair of trainers, mate. I was not prepared. I had a bag with cans of Coke in it. Um, in sugar rush. Oh, man. mate. I, I, I had chocolate. <clears throat> I had everything that you shouldn't fucking climb a mountain to do. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> do, do, you know, do you know when you get up to the three peaks and you get to that first waterfall and you're like, wow, I'm halfway. Yeah. Uh, is it, is, is it, it must be the top's just there. Nah, man, that was like a walk to Tesco's. That was like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, I was going to get myself a pot noodle by the time I got to that, to that first, that first one. And then you get up there, and when you're up there and you're struggling, but you know why you're doing it, so you keep pushing, you keep pushing. I actually nearly died up up there. They were, they were talking about getting me a helicopter down because obviously I struggled with my heart and stuff, and, and everyone said, no, don't do it. But I was like, nah, fuck this legacy. It's all about a legacy. It's about keeping that. And, you know, I had my reasons for going up. And um, you go, how much longer, mate? And they say, oh, it's just 20 minutes. So 20 minutes goes by, hour goes by, hour and a half goes by. How much longer? 20 minutes. And I was like, these fuckers have been lying to me the whole time. <laughs> you said 20 and, minutes two hours yeah. ago. <laughs> and I think I think it was Dean that was coming down the mountain, all laughing at us, making them say that. You know, and, and you probably get that as well. You hear a song, you hear something, you think yourself, you just look up at the sky and you just go, you fucker. You fucker. You know? But we keep pushing because the thing is, we know the pain. We know... We know the realization of never being able to hug your big brother. No physical pain will ever outweigh the emotional pain. It's true. I had um, something pop in the back of my knee on the first mountain, Ben Nevis, come out like a ping pong ball. And I never told anyone. I just carried on. And then I done snowed. And, and then I think it was when I got to the, no, done Scarfell Pike. And I think it was when I got to the bottom of Snowden. And my mum was stood there in the piss and rain at the bottom, waiting for me. You know, no fucks given. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just stood there. And I got it and I 
pulled out my trouser leg and there was this just thing out the back of my knee. What was it? I don't know, it went. Really? Yeah. So I, I spoke to someone and they, they, they said they had an idea of what they thought it was and they said it's, it will either stay or go. It's just one of those. Huh. So I'm not entirely sure it hurt. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> but yeah. But like I said, physical pain will never outweigh the emotional pain, the heartache. Mm. Yeah, and I, I've, I've felt the emotional side of it today. You know, our story's colliding like it has. Us meeting the way that we've met through pain. You know, having someone's life taken from you for a choice of somebody else feeling like that's that's the thing that needs to be done. It's something I never, ever thought I'd occur within my life, life, like full stop. I just didn't ever think that we'd become victims of such a cruel way of just, just, it's just cruel that we're now left to fight the rest of our lives. So we, I think we actually serve the life sentence. We do, and I've said this to so many people. We serve a whole life sentence. What would you do if you had if you had the rights to to the outcome to the sentence? What would you What would be it for you? What would bearing in mind think the way that you think now? Whole life sentence. I wouldn't want him. I don't want him to die because that's the easy way out. I'd imagine after. 10, 15, maybe 20 years, he'll want to die. That's when his suffering starts. We serve a whole life sentence up here. They say that they serve in, it's not until they get through the second half of their sentence before they realise the mistake they actually did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they sit in the cell and they're this and they're that, but uh, they say that it's um, for the first five years, they cause nothing but grief in jail to be able to state their mark that they're in there for a long time. They're fighting that the fact of anger, that why am I here? Do you know what I mean? The second half of the the 10 years is um, you're starting to settle in a little bit more calmer. You start to realise and then once you get to that 10, from that point to the end of the sentence is when they start turning to things like God and things like... Um, wanting to make a change, uh, wanting to get their story out there, trying to help people understand that it was wrong and trying to say their sorries. And I don't think I'm prepared for that second half, let alone the first half. It's been five years since my brother's gone. It's been four years since they've been in jail. So I think about that a lot of whereabouts they are mentally in their head. Yeah, I do. And what they've got inside um not inside what they've got in their inside you know, those four walls yeah because to them 10 ramen noodles and a pack of coke is like they're they're gods you know they're mm. you know they they've they've got everything they need to wheel and deal and to survive and to do their thing and we're out here do you think they should have all that lot stripped from them i've always said <clears throat> and, and my mum said it as well the second you take someone's basic right to life you should be stripped of all your human rights end of yeah and you should die behind bars if I was to be convicted for murder that's what I would expect no TV a, just a bed yeah bed and a toilet plain toothpaste my finger to use, I would expect that. Their six by four is bigger than the coffin that our loved ones buried in. Their six by four is much bigger than this cell up here. Their six by four isn't as dark as this cell up here. We don't get day release. We don't get parole. We don't get rehabilitation. We don't get freedom. We serve a whole life sentence up here. A good friend of mine, Michael Emma, I don't know whether you've heard of him, I've done a podcast with him, and um, he's a God-abiding man. Um, he's he's very powerful within his mind, and he, he talks to me a lot. Even still today, uh, last week I was speaking to him, he, he's a very, very good man, absolutely beautiful man, and um, he talks to me about forgiveness. 
And I say to him, I, I don't think I can forgive. I can move forward in the memory of the legacy, but I don't think I can forgive. And he says, you need to be able to forgive to be able to be fixed, or um, you need to be able to forgive to be able to move forward to the to the to the the holy grail of um, being able to help. You know, and he said it will come in time. I don't feel like I could forgive because I'd feel like I'd be letting my brother down if I forgive. Ever forgive. I was going to ask you the same thing. Is this something that you'd ever contemplated no. forgiveness? Would Would anyone ever come to you and say this? No. And I think they know better, to be honest. And I don't mean that in a fretful way. They just know my stance on it. I think the only person that me and probably you need to forgive is ourselves. And I'm not even ready for that yet. I've not even thought about that yet. I've not even thought about how can we forgive anybody else if we can't forgive ourselves? Not that I would want to forgive. I him. think that's what he truly means. I think that's what my friend means. You need to be able to forgive yourself. I think forgiveness within is very important to be able to spread the message that we have. But if I, if I come to terms to forgive myself for, my thoughts and what I would like to happen. That maybe the legacy stops. Because I'm at the end. If you forgive yourself, you're at the end of your journey, right? A new one starts. It's no longer the fight for the legacy. It's the fight for forgiveness against the world. I think the legacy will still continue because of love. I didn't know what love was until I lost him. So, and like I said, I'm not even in a position where I'm ready to forgive myself. But I think when that time comes, I will still continue because of the promise I made. And I made that promise based on love. You know, one of the, and another thing, one of the things my mum said to me is the more guilt you put on yourself the more you take away from the bastard who did it. Which, yeah. Never and, looked at it like that. And I've taken that on board. I still, I still suffer with guilt. And I think I always will. But maybe not as intense as I did before. Because it's like what mum says. It's, it's right. You very know? much so. That's an impact statement, that, isn't it? Where do you go from here? Me? I'm cycling from Land's End to John O'Groats this year. <laughs> and I get why you're doing it. I get why you're doing it. I push myself in a wheelchair from Felixstowe to here, and then from here to um, Woodbridge. In a, in a wheelchair. No aid, done it myself. There was a few of us that did it. Yeah. They had that. I couldn't even open my hands the next day. Oh, you know, it was like, and I went into that as well. Got my shorts and my vest on. <laughs> Got my gold chain on. And I was ready to go. I did it with my, uh, with my daughter on my lap. Everyone daughter on my lap. Done it with her. Pushed, pushed her whilst on my lap. But I had to do it. Uh, how to push myself but that's a hard one wheelchair you should try it and try a wheelchair you don't realize just how much you overlook the small simple matters of the all paths are not flat they're sloped so when you're in a wheelchair you're on one arm pushing more than you are on the other side that when you see someone in a wheelchair, you just go oh there's someone in a wheelchair or you just like oh don't look they're in a wheelchair you don't sit there and think Fucking hell, I should help him cross the road so he can use his other arm on his other shoulder. It is horrendous, mate. Mm. I, I, I I, definitely opened my eyes a lot when it comes to doing a lot of charity work in, in, in honour of 
um, you know, the people that need it. Are you my brother? Your brother? Um, the awareness is is great, and I, I tend to carry on pushing it. And I, I'm glad along the way that we've we've met each other. Um, you reached out to us on social media. Um, you know, pain brings people together, and um, I, I think it's very important that people that that don't feel pain can recognise the pain and help help with the matter because. Like, you know, for, for anyone out there that does listen to any of the podcasts that I do, the message is always pure enough and it's simple enough. Like, just don't commit crime. Don't do nothing stupid because the damage that it causes, um, the ripple effect is so extensive. It's actually life, soul and heart destroying. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's, it's one thing of always throughout everything is the ripple effect. The ripple effect on the family, the ripple effect on the community, the ripple effect on the schools, the ripple effect on the police, you know, the councillors. It's just catastrophic. It's just never ending. It's just. Yeah. Do you reckon that if they, if, if everybody had an insight to how this would feel, do you think people would still do it? No. I think if not, <clears throat> the insight, but the how we feel in here. If we could bottle up what we feel in here and say, yeah, I might take a swig of that, they wouldn't drink the whole lot. They'd take one mouthful, and I think that would be enough to... But it's putting that into words. Yeah. And it's connecting with people, and I think the barriers that we come up against is people believing that they won't be affected by it, i.e. because of the walks of life that they are, that money would stop them from getting killed, uh, the neighbourhood that they live in would stop that from happening, you know. Um, but even like you say, your brother lived a very humble life in a up-and-down flat that belongs to a rich man that separated that, that, that house into two, and now... The rich man who is never going to be affected by knife crime because he doesn't live that lifestyle. He doesn't, you know, hang around with them sort of people. Someone has died in his flat. Someone's died in his house. And now he's got to feel the negative that's going to come from that flat. No one's going to want to live there. No one's going to oh, want to move in there. No, you know? But this is it. It was get the stuff out of the flat. We need to get somebody else in there. Wow. The, the day after my mum found out my brother was murdered, she was in his flat clearing it out. The bloodied PPE that the paramedics wore was was still on the floor. My mum had to pick that up and clear it up herself. How did the police let you go in there without it being a crime scene and just like start wiping everything out? Because you're lucky that there weren't like evidence that would have been taken out to be able to well, create the conviction. It was, that was it. it. Apparently, that was there, all clear to go. You were allowed in there. So they did they not did, like break down the flat and be like, it started here, it ended up there, it they was done, here. They, they done obviously <clears throat> between it happening to mum actually finding out. You're talking what was it, 24 hours or whatever it was. To the police find it out. So in that time period, to their mum having to get to Stoke, it was all that was all done. But it just wasn't thoroughly looked at enough to think, well hang on a minute, that could upset a parent. We better clear that up. It was just fault, faultless. You could say the paramedics, because they left it there. But it's the whole here today, gone tomorrow <clears throat> scenario, isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. And it's like, like you say, the next day, they wanted the flat emptied so they can then carry on with life. Mm. And I, I found myself hating the public when this happened, because when I lost my brother, I saw people walking down the road laughing, and I saw people sitting outside pubs and I saw people in restaurants and holding hands and chattering. I saw someone singing in a park, you know, and I, I felt like walking up to him going, the fuck are you singing for? Yeah. What are you laughing at? Yeah. Why you, are you happy? Yeah, don't you know my brother's been murdered? Yeah. yeah. Like, and I found, like, with that, a lot of hate to society. And I only have myself to blame for that because how the fuck are they supposed to know? 
How are they supposed to know? It leads us back to saying being lonely. How are they supposed to know exactly how I'm feeling? Because they didn't know him like I did. I didn't know him like I did until I until I lost him. Mm. And then I realised I knew him exactly how I thought I knew him. I stood in that hotel bar in Stafford after I travelled up, stood there with tears in my eyes, ordering a pint, analysing absolutely everyone in that bar. Did you think if someone would have looked at you wrong that you would have just exploded? In that particular moment, no. There was other moments, yes. When I was walking down the street, and like you say, fuck, awesome. You should what find yourself being at? like, look at me. What right have they got to be yeah. happy? I'm not happy. My brother's just been fucking murdered. Why are they? What right have they got to be happy? What right have they got to celebrate Father's Day? Yeah. A birthday, a Christmas. My brother's kids can't. My mum can't, I can't, so why should they? Emotional roller coaster, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, massively. And there is, uh, and I, I always find with the message is, I don't think I'll be, ever be able to allow someone that hasn't lost someone the ability to be able to understand the pure extensiveness of the pain that's created from, from it. So I find myself connecting with other people that's, that's on this positive path to create an awareness, to try and find all these zombies thinking like life is just walking up and down the path. Do you know what I mean? And that's it. Mm. It's done. Like we're never going to be affected. We're never, this is never going to be a factor in our life. And I said on some podcasts before when I've been podcasted, um, one of them was on the, um, ben, Hatchett. ben Hatchett one where, um, you know, the counselor woman turned around and said that, um, you know, it's just junkies killing junkies and it's never going to affect us because we are, um, we, we don't live in that kind of neighborhood. And then she turns around and points to, um, just up the road here, there's some flats here and she goes, well, they live in places like that. You know, this, this is gov, this is a, this is a gov council scheme housing association. Mm -hmm. You know, they live in places like that. They don't live where we live. We live in more of the upper class, you know, and, and I, honestly, it, it took me so much not to just push her in, under a car as it was driving past when we were standing. Mm. You know, I just wanted to just push her and just go, well, you're affected now, ain't you? And just mm. let the car just run over her. And I was, standing, I was watching it on TV indoors. I've got obviously YouTube up on TV indoors. Yeah. And I turned to the missus. I went, did, that, did, did, did he actually just say that? Yeah. And she went, yeah. I went, and that's somebody who's supposed to be running your regional area regional area yeah save, save the kids yeah. save the pain save the town save themselves mate mm. that's all it is about it's all about to make sure no road works are happening in their area no rubbish why hasn't the caretaker been round to clean up the rubbish from the park you know people are not picking their dog shit up like that is what they worry about I generally thought that things would only change when it affected them. But since the two murders of two MPs, and God rest their souls, you know, it's obviously a, a really tragic thing, nothing's changed. I always turn around and said, I'll wait and see until one of you are affected before I see you make a change. Yeah. But it's a shame it's got to come to that. I think Benjamin Franklin said, justice will not be served until those that are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. Oh, never heard that before. Mm. It's true. Mm. And it is. And that's exactly what you're saying there. Why is old words fallen on new age people? <laughs> how, can this, can, how can words like that go down in history but not be absorbed by century? It's mad, isn't it? I think two packs of calls, Mum said. Remember to keep yourself alive. There's nothing more important than that. I didn't realise 
life was worth living to the extent it is. I know it's valuable, but I don't, you don't value it when you've got nothing to show what it's worth is, right? You have children. You teach them, they move on, you get old, you die, right? That's the life. It's a circle of life, right? That's what we're led to believe. But in our life, in our life, it's our job to be, create a footprint like your brother. If there was someone that was hungry, he had a tin, he'd have two spoons, one tin. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like... He left. You found out so much about him and he never bragged about it. People told his story. That is living. That is life. The fact that somebody else tells your story for you in a positive way, your brother lived. And what you're doing is creating the legacy to carry on. Your brother done that himself. Mm. Do we do it out of guilt? Partially. Do we do it because if we don't, they're forgotten? Again, partially. One of our biggest fears is that our loved ones will be forgotten. Three generations, they reckon. There you go. Three generations. I don't think that will ever happen for my brother. Three generations, because... I'll do um, I'll do everything I can to make sure that that carries on through my children, my grandchildren, and and everything else. It's been real powerful today, man. Definitely, man. And I really appreciate you coming all this way to share this with me, brother to brother. It's been emotional. It was always going to be. Yeah. I know why you've done it. I know why I did it. You're the first brother I've spoken to properly. And it actually hit me harder than what I thought, mate. But it helped me too. Good. I appreciate you, man. No, I appreciate you too, mate. Is there anything else you'd like to... Um, don't think so. I think that's it. Crazy, huh? Mm. Oh, mate. 